Chapter 6, Section 2, Objectives, we're going to look in more depth at covalent bonding, specifically the difference between polar and nonpolar. We're going to look at diatomic molecules, single, double, and triple bonds, and identify polyatomic ions. So a covalent bond occurs when there is a sharing of electrons. This is the key to distinguish it from an ionic compound. It can be polar, which means there's an unequal sharing of the electrons, or it can be nonpolar, which means there's an equal sharing of the electrons. And it's also important to realize that covalent bonds occur between two or more nonmetals only. So no metal is present in a covalent bond. It's the quickest way to tell when you have a covalent bond if there is no metal present. Covalent bonds are a nonmetal plus a nonmetal. Recall on the periodic table, here's the staircase starting at boron. And everything on the right side of that staircase are the nonmetals. So an example of a covalent bond might be CO2, carbon dioxide with carbon element number six and oxygen element number eight, both being nonmetals. Another example might be phosphorus trichloride, where you have phosphorus bonded to chlorine. If you were to have a bond such as calcium chloride, because calcium is on the left side of the periodic table and chloride is on the right, this would not be considered a covalent bond. So nonpolar covalent is an equal sharing of electrons. Notice that the electron cloud has an equal distribution for both atoms involved in the bond. A polar covalent bond is an unequal sharing. This is where the more electronegative element has a stronger pull on the electrons, causing it to have a partially negative charge, noted with the symbol S to the negative. Kind of looks like a squiggly S with a negative symbol. It means partially negative. On the opposite side of that, we have the S with the plus, and that means partial positive charge. So the sharing of electrons is more toward the more electronegative element leaving the other element to be slightly positive. Finally, recall that an ionic bond is where there's a transfer of electrons from one atom to another, so there's no sharing going on in between them. Here are two more examples of nonpolar and polar. We have a nonpolar compound between two hydrogen atoms. Notice equal sharing of the electrons. Same thing with two chlorine atoms. A polar covalent bond, example, between hydrogen and chlorine, note that the electrons are pulled more toward chlorine, and it's because chlorine is more electronegative, therefore has the stronger pull on the electrons. This has the partial negative, while hydrogen has the partial positive. And so we draw an arrow towards the chlorine with a plus sign at the other end of it. Covalent bonds are also known as molecules. By definition of a molecule, it's two or more atoms bonded together. A molecule is always neutral. So some examples are O2, which is over here on the right-hand side, H2O, which is just below. It's very classic water, the molecule, because it looks an awful lot like Mickey Mouse because due to its structure. And finally, we have glucose, which is the larger molecule in the center. Glucose is made up of six carbons, which are the gray, the six oxygens, which are red, and 12 hydrogens, which are the little bitty light gray. Molecular formulas show what kind of element you have in the formula and how many of each there are. For example, in water, we have two hydrogens, and this is noted by the little two next to hydrogen, the subscript lets you know how many of that one you have. And then we have one oxygen. Notice next to oxygen there is no subscript, and that's because it's an understood one. 
Another example, we can look at glucose again, C6H12O6, and this would imply that we have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. Diatomic molecules is a molecule of only two atoms. So some elements on the periodic table do not exist alone in nature, so they bond with themselves and become diatomic. Now for the record, any molecule made up of two elements, for example, for example hydrofluoric acid, is considered diatomic because it's made up of two different atoms. It could be two of the same atoms and that would also be considered diatomic. So for example, O2, which is oxygen, because it's made up of just two oxygen atoms, is considered diatomic as well. So there are seven elements on the periodic table that only exist diatomically, meaning they don't exist alone in nature. Those elements are going to be hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So their formulas are going to be as follows. H2, never just H. It has to be H2. Instead of just N, we have N2. Instead of just O, it's O2. Instead of F, F2, Cl2, Br2, and I2. Notice on the periodic table, they're highlighted in pink, the diatomic elements. We have hydrogen, and then over here we have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So if we had Iron, for example, I can have iron alone in nature because it's not diatomic. However, nitrogen can never be written as just N because it's diatomic, it actually has to be N2. The octet rule states that atoms will gain, lose, or share electrons in order to have a full outermost energy level of eight electrons or two depending on the scenario, in the valence shell. So here's an example where carbon is sharing electrons with oxygen, and notice it has eight surrounding it. Where the oxygen shares with the carbon as well, and notice that gives that oxygen eight, as well as the other oxygen. On the right, this is an example of ionic, where they're being transferred, leaving this with a duet of electrons for stability, and the element on the right will have the octet of electrons for stability. There's such a thing as multiple bonds only when you have a covalent compound. You can have what's called a single bond where all atoms have one bond or one pair of electrons being shared between them. So each time you see a line, that equals one pair of electrons. In the second example, double bonds, you'll notice that there are two bonds in the center and that would be two pairs of electrons. And then a triple bond is where we have three bonds between two atoms, and that's three pairs of electrons. These will come into play more when we get to drawing Lewis structures. Bond energy, FYI, is the energy needed in order to make or break a bond. So that energy is either absorbed or released, and that's known as bond energy. Bond length is the average distance between two bonded atoms. Polyatomic ions are going to be two or more non-metals bonded together and they have a charge. It's not neutral. So we form, and they form compounds with oppositely charged ions. So our first example is going to be phosphate, where you have phosphorus, which is a non-metal, oxygen, which is also a non-metal, and there's four of them, and see they have this charge. That charge is what makes this known as a polyatomic ion. More than two or more atoms with a charge. Sulfate on the right hand side, sulfur is a nonmetal, oxygens are all nonmetals, and because together they have a charge, makes this also considered a polyatomic ion. Because it's a negatively charged ion, it'll tend to try to bond with positively charged atoms or other ions. In our next section, we'll identify the following as ionic, covalent, or polyatomic in section 2B.